Hello, this is Stuart from Hear Me See Me podcast, and today I've got a very special, special lady. Um, it's Taban Shoresh from the Lotus Flower Charity. Hello, how are you, Taban? Hi, I'm good, thank you. Thank you for having me on. <laughs> no, it's my pleasure. I've heard a lot about you. We've never met, we've never spoke, you know, but I have heard a lot about you because we've got some mutual friends. And um, uh, if you could, tell me about yourself and about... Um, the lotus flower okay so it's it's a bit of a journey um and it kind of starts with my history i guess so i'm a genocide survivor from saddam hussein's era um right. i was a child political prisoner at the age of four and i escaped being buried alive with my family you um, escaped from, sorry. being buried alive Oh, wow. Yeah, so I, I do get that reaction quite a bit. <laughs> um, it's a very, very long story, which hopefully one day I'll get down on paper. But we wow. were rescued uh, miraculously and we managed to escape and um, went through fleeing. So we spent many months fleeing the war and spent it in hiding as well. And then eventually we were smuggled into Iran for um, safety. And as soon as we reached Iran, my father was meant to meet us there, but he was poisoned by Saddam Hussein. He'd hired a husband and wife to poison a group of men, and he was one of them. So when we were reunited, um, basically my dad was poisoned and Amnesty International had to fly him to the UK to get medical treatment. So we waited a year and that's how I ended up in the UK at the age of six as a refugee. And um, I'd say we lived a pretty normal life here. Uh, I went to school, went to uni, ended up working in the city. And then in August 2014, ISIS had gone into um, northern Iraq, Kurdistan region, and basically just caused absolute havoc there. Um, the conflict had uh, not only killed many people, but it also displaced uh, like hundreds of thousands of people. So I decided to leave my city job there and go back and work for an organization there. And my first day we were distributing aid um, and rescuing people trapped on a mountain. And I mean, thousands of people. So that experience was, you know, it stayed with me forever. And for the next 15 months, um, we spent it building camps, building schools, doing lots of aid distributions. So it's very, very frontline. And I got to work quite closely with the Yazidi women who'd been impacted. Um, and they were the ones who were taken by ISIS, um, raped, sold on as sex slaves. And so when they were rescued, they were coming back to the camps. And because journalists wanted to interview them, I would um, support in finding um, suitable women and just make sure that the stories were covered ethically and the women were protected so through that kind of work I got to work quite closely with the women and when I came back to the UK in November 2015 it was a you know I, I came back in a bit of a shock in terms of what I'd experienced so it took me some time to compose myself again and just kind of come over what had happened but I knew one thing and that was I needed to do something to help even if it was from here. So I decided to set up Lotus Flower in March, 2016. And I set it up in my living room, same living room, um, and set it up with no money whatsoever. But we had a project that we wanted to implement because we'd already asked the women on the ground. So we did an assessment and asked what kind of projects they wanted. So we managed to fundraise 25,000 pounds for that project and from there so since march 2016 to now it's just grown and grown and grown and that kind of shows this the need for the support um especially for women and girls inside camps and you know so now we have three centers in um three refugee camps in the region but we operate in more uh, camps as well um we've managed to help 26,000 women and girls to date We've implemented over 30 projects and it's just been growing and growing like it's 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 phenomenal to see it grow in that way, but also to see the, the lives that we're, we're changing. Um, so that's that's a sh short version. <laughs> of the story. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm lost for words, you know, like 
it's so heartbreaking, you know, that, that what you're saying. And it's the story, the see, these stories are so crucial to get people to understand the plight of refugees and to understand what it's like in camps and things that that the, the need is there. Um, and, you know, women being raped, being put in, into sex slavery and, and, and all of those things, it, it, it's just horrific. Um, as, a, as a father, I've got four girls, I've got two granddaughters, you know, I, I, I can't begin to understand what it must be like for a parent to have that happen to those children or for a child for that happen to their mother and, and these things. I, I, I think that what you're doing is amazing. I think what, what, what it is, um, it, it, I can't, it's just, it's floored me a little bit. I knew what we were gonna talk about, but it's floored me. Um, so we, we both got to know each other through, um, uh, I've got a family member, Greg, and his, his partner, Kathy, like, yeah. What well, you know, it's amazing what they told me. But tell me about how you you come to meet those and and what happened with that. It's it's. I mean, that is such a phenomenal story. So in terms of how that came about, um, so going back to the Yazidi women that were taken, raped, and sold on as sex slaves, because um, I'd been working in the region, and in two thousand and sixteen, I went to visit a group of, um, it's like an army force, Peshmerga, so an, a specific army force that was created for these women. Now, Kurdish women, in our history, we've always had Peshmerga, so we've always had um, fighters and army, you know, like soldiers. Um, so it's nothing new to us, but it was very interesting for me because I wanted to know why they'd set up this specific one for Yazidi women. And when I went to visit them, um, they were training like you would in any um, military force. And I was speaking to one of the commanders and they said, actually this, not only do they have the freedom to go and fight, we train them as well, but actually this is more of a mechanism to let their anger out because they have so many emotions that are stuck inside of them because of what they've experienced. This is an avenue for them to release that now that stuck with me forever. And I thought, well, I'm working with the same women. I, you know, I'm a charity. I can't do anything with, you know, military or armed forces, but what can we use that will A, support them in helping them channel their emotions, but also build their confidence to start rebuilding that self and that identity. Um, also something that's good for their health and um, mental health. So boxing came up and I thought, oh, this is a great idea, but boxing doesn't exist in the region really for women. So I thought, oh, okay, right. We might be up for, <laughs> how's this gonna work? Um, now, because we're so close to the culture and we're so close to the community, we almost work at their speed instead of us going, right, this is what you need to do and that's it. We, we work with them and we know when's the right timing for something. So it actually took, so 2016, when did we implement? Um, oh, we went out last year. So it took a good two to three years for us to actually implement it because that's the time frame that was needed for us to go, okay, now is the right time to do it. Yeah. And we were introduced to Kathy and she found out about the project and she absolutely loved it. And the idea was, was to use Kathy, Greg and Boxology to be the trainers that train our women to become boxing instructors for the rest of the women. Yeah. And so it just, it just all made sense. All the elements came in, you know, Kathy and Greg are very, very um, supportive of mental health. And, you know, they bring that into the boxing as well. So it just, it was, it's like a marriage made in heaven. So I thought this is perfect and proposed that they would support the project and come out and do um, train the women. And so they came out and they went out last year. And I think, I'm pretty sure it was like nothing that they'd experienced before on so many levels. Um, I think firstly, 
you know, what we see of Iraq or northern Iraq is just conflict, 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 conflict. And, you know, there's always been conflict there, but actually the northern part is quite safe. Um, it's, it's not super safe, but it's, it's very, very safe. Like the security forces there are very good. And so I, I had no worries for them to go out there, um, but always said, you know, this is completely up to you. You know, I can't guarantee anyone's safety for anything. Um, but when they went out there, they realized that it's nothing like what they see on the news and it's nothing like what is projected in the world. Like it's, it's, and we've had that feedback from everyone. The first, the moment you step in Kurdistan, you realize it's actually nothing like what you see on the news. Yeah. Um, so that was the first experience of the region. And then when they went out to visit the women and girls, I think that just blew them away because it made them closer to, to the actual stories. And some of the stories are so horrific. Like you said, you've got daughters and I, you know, we have women who had their daughters at the age of seven taken and raped by six different men and sold on in the moment of three years. So they were working with these kind of women and for them, it was very, very difficult. And for the first time to actually be face to face with that and put a real person to it, um, I think it was very emotional for them. Um, for me, it's always emotional for me, but I've almost experienced a lot in my past. I've, I've strangely, strangely, this is the norm like i've experienced yeah. it as a child i've i was born into conflict i've seen conflict i've fled from conflict so you're kind of prepared for those things so it's not a massive shock in that way um but i think for kathy and greg it's the first time that they'd encountered something like that so it became very 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 real and they automatically connected with all the women and they carried out their training sessions the women absolutely loved it and we still continue today. I mean, COVID's got in the way a little bit, but it still carries on and they love it. It's, it's, and you can see the change in the women, the, the confidence, the mental health, the rebuilding, the channeling of energy. It's just, it's phenomenal to watch. It was a great idea as well to, to not go out and, and teach a few people how to box, was to go out and teach a few people how to train the boxing to then pass on, it's that sort of give a man a fish, you know, or, or give him, teach him as a fish, you'll eat for the rest of his life. It, it's that, yeah. yeah, that's something that, that can continue and grow. And, and with it, I mean, I've got a background of martial arts and I've, I've, I've got, you know, like follow a lot of martial arts. And the thing it always about is, is the discipline, the camaraderie, the self, the self belief, um, uh, the self esteem, it, 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 it raises all of those things. You know, so it's the, the mm -hmm. perfect, you found the perfect thing, and you found the perfect perfect people because Kathy and Greg, as you say, they're not. It's not they're not pure boxing. It's boxology. is, is all about the other side, the soft and the hard, and the, the, the you know the physical and the mental. Um, and so they are. The, they were really what you couldn't have found better. You know, yeah. I've, I've had Kathy on my podcast, so her stories married so perfectly. Yeah, what we're doing. Completely. And she shared and, and that created a connection with the women, you know, she shared her story and they yeah. really, really, really connected. And like you said, and the Lotus Flower, we are all about that. We're all about teaching the skills and giving the tools rather than just giving something and then taking it away. Um, so in all our projects, we try and make sure that we leave that kind of um, stamp on it. And I knew that, you know, we couldn't find women boxing instructors to, to teach the women. So we knew that we had to train women to teach them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because is it that thing of, um, I know when I'm, uh, when I'm doing haircuts for homeless, sometimes that, uh, sometimes in some religions that, um, and cultures that they can only work with a woman. Is, it, is, is that the case? Is it, they can't um, So I'd say it, it's a, it's still a pretty conservative society. I mean, it, it, 
yeah. it's moved on a lot like from my generation it's moved on so so much so many things have changed you know when I was a teenager and I'd go and visit back you didn't see women driving you didn't see like really really simple things but now you know you've got women working you've got women driving and you do have women in sports and all sorts of things but you do still have pockets of the community that are still very conservative. And the ones that we work with are conservative. They're from like rural areas. And so, um, and that's why our centers work because it is women and girls centers and therefore the families trust the centers and they fully trust the centers. And so having a women instructor there just builds that trust even more. There's no point in me trying to go and change a complete culture overnight it's not going to happen you kind of introduce things slowly and you know they become accepting of it and so and that's why it was a massive massive success is because we took that into account yeah. um, to start with we didn't have a, a a woman boxing instructor or martial arts expert um so we had to because we wanted to get them in the uh mood of training before Kathy and Greg arrived so we hired yeah. someone who was um I think it was kickboxing yeah. but it was a guy but that guy knew that community so he was accepted by them because they knew him so there are small things that we take into consideration which actually have a massive impact and so the way that we worked around it I think has been perfect yeah I mean we've, we've had to take it account with what we do sometimes that uh, generally, like a homeless a homeless centre is pretty much open uh, is as it is. But we sometimes go to women's refuges, and then there's sometimes people of the Muslim faith, and we set up screen. So if yeah. I am there, they put the screen up because it's uh, it's it's really not good for you know I I shouldn't be seeing that lady. Yeah, I shouldn't be seeing her. So we, you, you, but I think they're so that they're so glad that we're respectful of that. Yeah. That, because every it's even the people that aren't involved now they like the fact that we've respected that and, and you know yeah. it's all about tr building trust isn't it that's, that's completely it. it that's completely yeah. it and actually the way that kathy and greg just kind of hugged the culture was phenomenal because yeah. you know if especially kurdish people we absolutely love anyone that embraces our culture so we kind of welcome yeah. them and they they loved everything about it. And, and so I think they got that back in return as well. Um, but definitely it's all about building trust and kind of respecting it. You know, I'm not going to change. I don't expect anyone to be like me. I'm not going to change anyone overnight. So <laughs> all I can do is respect that the way that they're doing things and, and try and work around that. And that's what we try and do. So uh, it obviously came to an abrupt halt, didn't it, this year? Um, everything, everything has. How, how has it affected your charity then from, from when it yeah. stopped in March? So COVID has blown everything out of the water, but actually with us, um, we've managed to cope around it in that, so we were forced, so when COVID first happened, uh, our staff went out in the camps and they did hygiene distribution kits and then um, hygiene awareness especially with the kids on how to wash your hands and stay clean and then our sewing sisters made masks for those in the um, camps so we kind of adapted quite quickly and then it was full lockdown so nobody could come out of the camps nobody could come into the camps nobody could leave their homes you know the region had military out so you couldn't go out um, and from that we had to think of how we could still access the community and we're very lucky because we hire community outreach workers in the camps right. so i think we're one of the few organizations that do that because we know that if we hire from within the camp not only do you have people that's connected to the camp but in this situation it highlighted that we could continue some of our projects and what right. we did was we took things remotely so we did our awareness sessions remotely. We did our psychologist was available remotely. And so, and then after when lockdown was eased off a little bit, we did a COVID assessment to see what the impact was and what the needs were. And um, mental health was massively impacted across all the camps. Um, so it's good that we had our psychologist there. Um, the other, 
what else human trafficking early marriage gender-based violence all these things just increased and suicide rates all it just increased so thankfully for us being there carrying out those um the remote work was so desperately needed and so we continued but then another impact was that the funding pool had dropped for us so and many charities faced this we had donors drop left right and center and we were just left with this massive gap of funding pool and we didn't know how to fill it because you know everyone's applying for the same thing you've got local international donors that have left because they can't be there and so we're still having to support and provide the services but we don't have the funding coming in so it really really impacted our funding and so we launched an appeal and we were on the brink of closing but thankfully we've kind of saved ourselves but we still need to kind of fundraise to continue and make sure that never happens again um so covid has had its impact on different levels i'd say yeah i think that's a, an important thing because we understand from our own charity that we've uh, we've been going six years next month and uh, we've only really this last year or two got to the point where you know we've become a registered charity and and we're growing we were growing that's it yeah. but, but the, the thing is is it's up until this point it's that trying it's, it's getting funding in to keep moving but ideally you need to get larger funding so that you can plan for the future because if you can get some sort of substantial funding in place, you can then start to do a three year plan or a five year plan. But when it's a little bit like month to month, year to year, you you know, and some some parts of funds that come in that people don't realize that you have to use in a certain time. And so yeah. it, it, it's very difficult to have a long term plan when you're reliant upon uh, funds. I don't know if you find that. Mm -hmm completely. And also there's another element to it, like, a, you know, some donors just want to fund projects projects don't run on their own <laughs> they yeah. run with the organization without the organization the project does not run no. and so that's another thing but also as as you and i we're local we're implementers we're direct implementers we are the ones that do the work on the ground yeah and so what happens is we've realized that you have you know governments that say hey we're gonna we're gonna put a million aside for education and so they put a million aside then they choose a big, big international charity to give that million to. And so the million yeah. goes there. And then that million for that big charity, actually half of it's just spent on, I'd say, waste. Um, yeah. And then what happens is local or direct implementers have to compete for mm -hmm. about 50,000. And you're yeah. going, but hold on, that was a million. How's that got to 50,000? And we're now all fighting to try and get this 50,000. 50, so I yeah. think the funding, the funding mechanisms are need to be updated and realized. And I hope people do start supporting direct implementers because we're the ones doing the work. Um, yeah. We've almost got a middleman there that we don't really need. And yeah. so it's it's a bit of a challenge. It's a massive challenge. And I know that we're not the only ones facing that. So I really do hope, you know, all smaller charities get through COVID because from what I've seen, they are the hands-on direct implementers and without them, not much would happen. No, of course. And one of your, so I, I obviously when they came back, I spoke to Kathy and Greg about um, the project that they did. Um, and I, I, I sort of straight away, I, I said, oh, look, I'll come out there with you. Next time you go, I've got to come. And, you know, and then they said, well, we landed here and then we had to get Jeeps there and then we had to get an armed escort there. <laughs> and I started to backtrack a little bit. I was like, oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> but <laughs> in all seriousness, um, I think it'd be, it'd be great to come when they do finally get to come back. It would be great to do something, you know, maybe I could bring, because we do, we've got another arm that we're building, that we're doing education for homeless people. So teaching people to cut hair. And it's something that can is universal that, that, you know, obviously not a full blown level three education, but even if we can get a basic, a basic level of education to, for hairdressing. 
that I mean we do have so we've got a project called hairdressing sisters that we've oh, been trying to launch and basically my hairdresser <laughs> he's yeah. trying to come out to do that kind of teaching so it's something that we could partner up on and yeah honestly yeah. if you come out and it's I think it's a phenomenal thing to kind of be part of teaching someone a skill that you know that you've left that they'll be able to earn an income in so that I think is phenomenal and it is something that we have thought about we've always so planned COVID got in the way um but no absolutely would love for you to join us and just come out there and we yeah. could we could definitely do something around that and they love it they really yeah. do they want to learn these skills well, the, um, the great thing is i've got i've built up great uh, contacts with the industry over the last you know few years um so that i if i did come i could bring um equipment as well so i could bring oh, brilliant. yeah i could bring scissors and and lots and lots of stuff um, amazing so that we could we could it, leave the tools of the trade you know leave that, them leave that behind that would uh, be phenomenal that would be absolutely phenomenal let's talk about that i'm excited i just want COVID to go <laughs> i know it's getting it's got in the way um we was on such a we was on such a crest you know we was flying you know and it just yeah. took the sails it took the feet from under us because we yeah. was having we had like a documentary being made and we was having a big launch. It was, I was getting a bit full of myself, actually. So maybe the power above said to me, like, you, you're getting a bit full of yourself, mate. You need to come. I don't think the whole of pandemic was just to bring to take away my ego, but it, <laughs> it, it, was, <laughs> it was just, you know, when you think you pinch me, it's all going a bit too well at the moment. And then, I mean, for us, as you you could manage to carry on for a bit, we, we just literally dance halls overnight. So we 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 had five years solid work of building to from me on my own to sixty seven projects across the UK to six hundred volunteers. We've given out forty thousand haircuts, and then all of a sudden it just stopped overnight, you know. And I naively said, "Oh well, we'll just get going again when it passes." But the reality now is that we're having to open everyone again from almost from scratch you know I've got to go individually and get them going again and as we open one it, it one pops up and another one closes because we just wow. I think I've just had a, a message just before I come online with you for my poor lady in the north who's she's opened 10 projects around Manchester and they're just as fast as they're opening they're closing again closing. You know? oh. uh, but I the really important thing is them. is that we move forward you know, because it, it, we're going to keep getting this. The next year, we're going to get knocked back and knocked back and knocked back. But if, if we've got to rejoice in every victory, haven't we? You know, completely. And it's also figuring out how are there ways to work around it. Like, it, are there? I, I know in your industry, it's been massively, massively hit. Like, you know, massively hit. And so, I do hope the government figures out a way to support. I, I feel I feel like the support has been lacking. You know, there's been a lot of you can't do this and you can't do that, but the actual support has been lacking. Um, and if this something like this is going to happen again, then we need to know how we can operate around it. Um, I guess for our services, we can do most things remotely, but again, we can't do most things remotely as well. You know, a lot of our centers are reliant on the women coming to the centers. Yeah. Um, we've got a lot of businesses that we've supported and set up in the camps. They've all had to close overnight and so they've been impacted. Yeah. So it's it really is, we have to kind of figure out a way of planning ahead of, okay, well, if this happens again, what do we do? Mm. Um, and then sometimes as hard as it is, we just have to surrender and go, actually, there's nothing much I can do, um, yeah. which is what I had to do. At the start, I had to just go, if we are going to close, then there's nothing I can do. There's literally nothing else I can do in my power. But then miracles happen. So have faith, keep the faith and keep moving forward. It's one step in front of the other and magic happens with that. Yeah. I mean, do you find, I mean, you've, you've, you, you gave me a very short story of, of your upbringing and that, but I don't know, mine has been nowhere near like yours. You know, I, I, you know, I suffered from uh, sexual abuse when I was a kid and I went into addictions as I was older and all of these things. But I, 
my, my salvation has been helping other people. Yeah. So is, is this what drives you? Because you you know from from that background and you understand that yeah. is this your sort of antidote. So I would say, and I've experienced a lot of trauma, which includes abuse as well. Um, and the only way my head will accept any of it is there's a reason why I've had to go through all this pain. There's absolutely no way that I'm put on this world for me to experience all of that and then for nothing to happen. Like there's got, that's how my brain's accepted it is. Actually, you've gone through all this pain. You now need to figure out how to turn it into a purpose. And then yeah. now that's your power. So it's that formula that I work by and it's very healing to know that you're impacting the lives of others and supporting other people. Um, yeah. I mean, I've done a lot of healing on myself mm -hmm. to be able to get to that point where I can work with anyone that's gone through any kind of trauma where I'm not triggered. Um, mm -hmm. So you have to have your healing in place, your mechanisms and tools in place to support you. And the support that you need is continuous. Like, it's not yeah. like we're, going to wake up one night and that's it all our traumas are gone it doesn't happen like that yeah, yeah. It's, it's learning to sit with it learning to heal and learning to know as hard as it is that that happened for some sort of purpose yeah like not not many people in this world can cope with trauma and pain and if you right. notice most people that have gone through trauma and pain they're doing something phenomenal by helping others yeah that's how my brain equates it um yeah. i don't no, know i fully get that, that that's yeah. the same exactly the same for me it it, it yeah i mean it it had a hold over me for so many years you know like and it, it wasn't until i was at the, at the age of 44 when i took my last drink and my last drug and it wasn't it, it's actually through the recovery process that then i I finally accepted that it was something, but it didn't. It didn't uh, identify me anymore. It wasn't that wasn't me anymore, you know. Yeah. Uh, and and to, if I'm I'm always brutally honest with myself, I'd used that as an excuse for many many years because it was oh you know I'd I'd see a therapist or a counselor or a psychologist or get myself out of trouble because I've got myself into trouble and it would be after a short period it would be oh poor thing no wonder he no wonder he drinks <laughs> no wonder he takes drugs and all that and it becomes a tool and you end up sort of but all the time you're letting that happen to you you're letting you're letting that take control and you're almost letting it happen to you again and again and again mm -hmm. and it's not until you finally let go and you know i find forgiveness is is such a powerful thing they say you know to err is human to forgive is divine and I think that really means is that it's the most, when you forgive what's happened to you or you forgive someone else, you really are blessing yourself. That's, yeah. that's what really happens. You're, you're completely letting go at that point. When you can truly forgive, you, you, you let go. And the, the power of that goes and the power within you rises, you know. Completely, completely. And also forgiveness. And I've noticed like over the years of doing all the healing work, um, forgiving yourself, we forget, we, we forget to forgive ourselves. You know, we forget to forgive ourselves for not speaking up when that thing was happening to us or not stopping that thing when that thing was happening to us. And that is crucial. Actually, before forgiving anyone else, need to forgive yourself because when you start putting the focus back on you and actually something magical happens and of course you forgive others but in a way forgiving others you know for some really horrible things that people do to you it is actually unforgivable that's why the word is unforgivable right but for you to have the power to forgive that person it's not just letting that situation go from your identity and attachment but it's also a lot freeing yourself 
you're out of that prison. And like you said, it's it takes a hold over you. And I think for me, when I started realizing all of this, I went, the decision was really, really clear for me. I thought, am I going to let my past control me? No. Therefore, I make a completely different future. And that's what I've done. So I thought I can continue that way or I can stop, make a change and just create a completely different future. And that means breaking a lot of cycles, means breaking a lot of patterns. It means breaking barriers in my culture. It means breaking so many things, but also the most important thing that you're breaking is you're breaking your old identity. And that's quite hard to do. That's a really hard thing to do. Um, but I do believe that, and I genuinely do believe that people that have experienced pain or extreme pain in this world are here to heal others. You've just got that gift in you because something so wrong has happened to you. You would never want that to happen to somebody else. Therefore you turn that around in a way where you can stop anything from happening to somebody else. Um, but you also have to remember yourself. So it can be very easy to get into the cycle of giving, 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 and which is important but in that you know with trauma there's a, there's a part of trauma where we kind of learn to give because we've we've we're missing something in ourselves we weren't given something we weren't given I mean most of the time it's the love that we should have had so we're always giving to seek that love so it's really important to kind of understand and break that and go no I'm not giving because I want love I'm giving wholeheartedly, unconditionally, and I'm also yeah. going to give to myself. So, yeah, no, we're going deep now. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's worthwhile, isn't it? I mean, yeah. it's like, because uh, the thing is, I mean, I, I forget I'm doing this stuff. And uh, to me, I'm just chatting to new people all the time. And I love people. I, I find people fascinating. Um, yeah. and, and especially someone like yourself who, who What's interesting to me as well is that not only have you gone against your past, you know, you've gone against, you let's say you've broken those chains yeah. of your former identity and created your own new future. That that's inspiring itself. But also, as you said, you've broken broken some boundaries of your own culture, um, and that's not an easy thing to do. Yeah, no, it's not. I mean, my divorce was one. <laughs> Um, I think there's over time, it's got a lot better. Like the taboos in my culture have got better, but they're still there at times. Um, but I've managed to somehow detach myself from it because I'm very true to what I'm doing. I've realized this is my truth. This is what I'm doing. And this is what I believe in. Um, and I have full confidence in myself and respect in myself to be able to do that. Just to kind of give you an example, I, I won't forget that um, when I was out in Kurdistan, uh, I we were on Mount Sinjar and, you know, because it, it was a military op operation, it was still very, it's quite dangerous. So we were going into like territory where there was, I could see the bombs dropping, <laughs> literally. Yeah. It wasn't far. It was very dangerous. And on Mount Sinjai is where, you know, when the when the Peshmergas, you know, our soldiers um, had caught the region, they kind of took over the whole mountain and it was full of men. Now we have female Peshmergas who are fighters, but when you're a female Peshmerga, they just go, right, you're one of the guys. Yeah. And then outside of that context, they don't see many women going into situations like that. So in that particular situation, I remember sitting with the mayor because I'd, I'd gone with my team and I was the only woman there um, or the only Kurdish woman that wasn't a Peshmerga. And he sat down and said, I have so much respect for your family for allowing you to come out here with all these men and just you know, be trapped here overnight and there's a war going on there. And, you know, they must have so much faith and confidence in you. And I really respected him for saying that because I've never heard it from anyone else. And I've always thought 
what is it that allows me to do that? But I th it's knowing my truth. Like there's nothing wrong with what I'm doing. And I wholeheartedly believe that. And I will sit there and confront that with my family and they know it's true. Therefore they have nothing to say. <laughs> um, so I think being in that truth and when you're, when, when you're not doing anything wrong, there's not much many people can say. And so I, I've carried that and that's helped, I'd say, break those boundaries. And, you know, even now, I think that attitude has allowed me to have male friendships in my culture. Um, you know, there are male friendships with other women and guys and stuff, whereas in certain regions, it's quite um, restricted. But I've never faced those taboos. I think leaving my divorce was a massive taboo, but, you know, it wasn't it wasn't the best marriage. Um, it was abusive and I walked away and, and I walked away at a time when it was a taboo. So you didn't get that support. Um, but even then I was like, uh, something wrong is happening here. I'm not going to put up with it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so I think it's definitely just sitting in your truth and knowing that you're wholeheartedly right in what you're doing. And so when you do that, some people accept it and some people don't. And what's the wonderful thing is, is that there are people in that same situation that are held or bound by that, um, you know, restriction that then see that as an example of hope, you know, you doing that and other women doing that. It's more like you don't have to put up with this. There's things yeah. you don't have to put up with in this life. Um, Completely. I think there's a, there's a, there's a beauty in storytelling and, um, so I'm looking to create a podcast soon and I'm looking for people's aha moments. I'd love to have you on to figure out what your aha moment was. And that is, you know, yeah. what was that moment that kind of triggered all of this? And there's a beauty in stories and inspiring other people and making them realize. I think recently I spoke about, um, my marriage and what happened and a few women reached out to me and said oh I didn't know that's happened to you that's happened to me but I've never been able to say and so it's it's that power of sharing when you see somebody else has gone through it mm. it almost puts you at ease not because they've gone through it but because you're not the only one well when you do it I'll be glad to because I owe you one <laughs> oh I'd love well, I'd love I've to have you on I've got to return the, the favor oh, so yeah. <laughs> thank you yeah. Yeah, I've, got, I've had quite a few aha moments. You know, so. <laughs> well, that's going to be a beautiful share, a story to share. I, I get so fascinated by them because I don't think, you know, I think everyone has them, but some people ignore it. Yeah. And that's the thing. It's, you know, the ones that don't ignore it end up doing stuff with it, which, which is beautiful. And so, yeah, definitely we'll have you on there for that. Well, I think as, as well, it's all about action because if, 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 if you don't take action quick enough, I mean, this has been my story that if you don't take action quick enough, you, you quickly, your, your mind will deceive you into thinking, oh, it isn't like that. So it, it, it's how quickly you take action on things, you know, uh, you know faith, everything's wonderful. My favorite saying is uh, God can move mountains, but you're best to bring a shovel. Because, yeah. <laughs> you know, I love that. Because it's and it is. I've got I've got I've got faith that everything will be better. I've got faith that uh, in in the long run we'll succeed. But you know we've got to roll our sleeves up. You know we can't yeah. just stand that, and we've got a we can't just have ideals and that. We've we've got to be strong enough to live live those ideals as well as you are. You know you've got to live, live what you believe in. Completely, and I um that's action is key i think action is key and that's how the lotus flower started you know i had it, it suddenly came up as an idea i knew exactly why i wanted to do what i wanted to do and if i let my brain think over it too much i would have thought i have no money there's no way i can do this i'm here they're there like i would have thought of a million reasons why i couldn't but instead i sat in this living room put some post-its like papers up yeah. planned it out roughly and went and registered literally went right I'm registering because if yeah. I don't register I'm not going to do it so right. I registered and then went oh I have to do it now <laughs> yeah we, we think so like because that 
exactly what I've done in the past with things. And it's like, once I got a little bit of momentum with the, with the homeless and I was like, right, I'm going to launch in Leeds, you know, like, and it's a, uh, I wouldn't work out, I'd, I'd sort of say, right, in May we're opening in Leeds and then I'd work backwards, you know, like, then I'd find a venue, then I'd find a team leader, then, you know, but it, it happens if you put pressure on yourself, like positive pressure, I think. Is, is, yeah, is definitely positive pressure. I think recently I've been under quite a lot of pressure, but I also know when to step back. Yeah. So it's very important to know and listen to yourself and know exactly when okay it's if anything's going to work you need to be working before it so you have to kind of step back and tend to your needs but i do work well under pressure <laughs> yeah yeah I, I do myself i think it um it, it spurs me on a little bit you know i like a challenge but um as you say it's it, it's also and it comes back to the forgiveness part that it's realizing when Right, some of this is is out of my hands, you know. Right, I try to I try, I try to control a pandemic. I'm that egotistical, you know. <laughs> <laughs> then I went, hang on a minute, Stuart. You 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 know, like you just go where you can go, and if they can't, if you can't go, like we were supposed to go to Liverpool this weekend for a launch, and you know we picked that right, but you know, but I'm back at the Whitechapel Mission tomorrow, so as long as I can go somewhere. And do what I love doing and help some people in the long term, we'll be fine. We'll be back out there and we'll be doing what we do. Yeah, yeah, 100%. I think definitely have the faith and the hope. And that's another thing. I kind of, when we were on the brink of closing, I just surrendered and yeah. went, we're doing something good here. If you want us to continue, then help us out here. Yeah. I actually, I don't know who I was asking for help. Yeah. Went, dear universe, I'm sending it out there. We are doing something phenomenal. We're changing lives. Yeah. We're on the brink of closing. So if you want us to kind of stay alive, yeah. you need to open some doors. And the doors opened. So yeah. there's Fun. there's a magic in asking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I it is. I've done it so many times. So many times. And, and I think that's where faith comes in that, you know, it, it doesn't matter. It, 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 as you say, it doesn't matter who you're asked in. But you've got to ask, you know, you've got to ask yeah. that question because uh, what it is, it's taking it away from you. It's taking that control away from you that you because sometimes you haven't got the answers. They have to come from elsewhere and they do come. Once you start talking and start listening, you start to get answers. Completely, completely. Yeah, we're definitely on the same wavelength. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Like I've known you for years. It's the first time we've ever, we've ever spoken. It's funny, isn't it? When you when you when you do get introduced to people like that. So for the future, what 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 do you really need for the future for for the Lotus project? I think we need to continue fundraising to help us continue going. Um, I would say I need to focus on building future funding as well because yeah. I never want to be in this position again. Yeah, and I think as you know, we have to stop and pat ourselves on the back and say, you know, you, you started this from nothing. You've got it to where it is. Yeah. And now it's growing. Need to have more hands in to help. Um, so we're at that stage. I think we would love to continue our projects. You know, hopefully this global pandemic thing will go and we'll continue our projects on the grounds our centers will be open again Kathy and Greg can come out you guys can come out yeah. you know that's what we're all about is continuing those projects where it's most needed because we're working with a community that's very much forgotten um when it's in the headlines and when it's in the media everyone knows about it yeah. but when it's gone you forget that there are people living in camps there are yeah. people that live in a tent there are people that live in a cabin and they've been living there for years and years and years. Yeah. And it could be like 10 people in the tent. And what we're trying to do is make life as easy as possible while they're there yeah. by helping them build skills that they'll be able to use in the camps. But even once they leave. Yeah. It, it's, it's crucial um, because what happens is it's a bit like us with our, with our projects. 
and with the homeless situation in in Britain is it's almost like it comes out for Christmas you know everyone <laughs> everyone does this all this and it's my I'm not knocking it I, I think it's great if one does you know at least come together at that time but yeah. it's a it's all year round you know like it, it's when the light stops shining that's when the work needs to really be done because yeah. it's easy to get stuff done at those times um so as you say, it, it's important for that work to carry on when the light isn't shining on the, on your projects. Completely, that's it's, it's the most critical time, I'd say. Yeah. And, I mean, we try and do our best to shine the light on it as much as we can, but yeah, there there needs to be support on a larger yeah. scale, I'd say as well. Well, what I'll do at the end, you know, I will put all the links on there. If you, you're amazing, thank you. Links. We put all the links on. Um, I'm fascinated by it all. Uh, I'm sure that when Greg and Kathy go out there, that I can come along. Obviously, um, you guys are already getting it started, so don't want to take over, but I'm happy to help. I'm happy to support. Yeah, we'll work something out. Yeah, I'm, I'm more than happy to support in that. And hopefully next year we can get out there. Uh, yeah. And at some point, I'd love to meet you in person, have a cup of coffee, and you know. <laughs> definitely, definitely, I know, right? Once yeah. all this is over, we can go out of our houses. I mean, I don't even know what the rules are now. I've lost track. <laughs> um, I, I, I just, I just, yeah, I just, I just check on a daily basis, one day at a time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hopefully, we will meet. Thank you so much, yeah, Stuart. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time, and um, you take care and keep in touch. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thanks.